G'day guys and welcome back to the Back Pocket Plug Up Podcast. My name is Cade McDonald and I'm joined by my co-host Connor Rogers. Rog, how are you mate? Yeah, never better McDonald. Um, I'd like to apologise to our loyal <laughs> and growing fan base for my absence last week. I hope uh, Druzy did the show proud and it was easy listening for everyone. But uh, you know, don't panic. Um, you can sleep comfortably again because I am back in the seat <laughs> and we are ready to talk some footy on the Back Pocket Plug Up podcast well we'll get to the footy stuff soon but how has your extensive and intensive week of uni been big fella uh well it's come to a close it was probably the most regretful decision i've ever made um (laughs) thinking yeah let's do a whole semester worth of uni in two weeks but i managed to knuckle down get it done and the leading uh bit of inspiration from start to finish of it was knowing at the end of it the nice little pot of gold at the end of the rainbow is once again another back pocket plugger podcast so yeah not not the grades not (laughs) Not the the diploma couldn't couldn't care less about the grades as long as we get the 50 percent and the pass mark, uh, we sold you right, and that's absolutely all that matters. How was the show last week, mate? I did listen to a, a bit of it, but I didn't manage to listen to all of it. Well, um, yeah, the show show went well. Druzy was great. Um, he, he was a nice little, uh, oh, geez, back pocket plugger, sort of off the pine type role player. Came in, um, played his role. Nah, it, it went well, went swimmingly, but there's nothing like getting the best 22 and nothing like getting the best two back in uh, back in the side. One thing that was a little bit of a bit of an issue was the headline. I had to go headline mode. I went alliteration over sort of functionality of my headline and butchered it. So I'm going to throw <laughs> the orders back to you this week if you want to kick us off with the show. I will. This one's nice and simple, but I'm, I dare me to say it, Dossie. Dare me to say it because it's not one that comes easy. No, nah, you won't say it. You I'll, won't. I'll say I it. Dare I'll say it all right. <laughs> Dynasty <laughs> done. I oh, repeat. no. Dynasty done. I'll be the one to say it. Everyone's there going, don't write them off. Don't you dare <laughs> oh, no, write Rog. them off. They'll prove you wrong in September. They won't prove me wrong in September. They are finished. Are they even going to get to September at this point, well, the a, Tigers? It's a great question. They're in there by percentage at the moment, which breaks me heart as a um, someone uh, someone's team who was meant to be in and around the top eight mix. Um, I wouldn't have been so heartbroken that we're not in there if uh, if – they were – the top eight were like a resounding top eight. Like, you know, these are the best yeah. eight teams in the comp. But seeing yeah. Richmond be a bit feeble, seeing Fremantle um, there or thereabouts and teams like St Kilda there or thereabouts, it does make me think this is a season gone missing for us. But um, enough about the baggers. The Tigers, <laughs> uh, they just can't seem to get it going. And it's not like they're building to something. It's not like nah. you're saying, oh, yeah, we're starting to see the puzzle pieces fall into place and give it a few months in September, they'll be primed. If anything, it's the opposite, and we're seeing them crumble. It's a really bizarre time. Um, yeah, it's just uh, nothing's working for them, as you were saying. They they're just not functioning the way the Tigers, uh, as we have learned to to know, function. They are just fumbly. They're sh- the the pressure's not there. It is just sort of a Richmond footy club that we haven't seen for a few years. I think their draw gets a little bit easier, but they're losing men every week. I think they lost Bolter and Broad maybe this week, and they're sort of dropping like flies. You know, they they get players back who have been missing, and they lose players. They just seem at this point in the season. I'd love to clip this and see how it goes in another six months' time, but at this point. They looked a bit cooked. Well, for the record, and this goes against the popular opinion, this is something that a lot of people will probably turn their nose up at me for. Um, but I actually, and you know, people won't believe this considering I'm a Carlton supporter and they are the Tigers, just about our arch nemesis. But I yep. love seeing champions be champions. Like I love Phelpsy. Keep on winning your gold medals <laughs> in the swimming. Usain Bolt, keep on going. Like I love yep. seeing the champions be champions. And believe it or not, I would not be opposed at all to Richmond winning another flag because that's something you remember forever. Like another team winning the premiership this year. Um, don't get me wrong. I'd love to see the D's win it. But if it's the D's, if it's the dogs, you know, someone yeah. has to win it every year. You know, a team will win it. But to see a team go four premierships in that close proximity and, you know, go a three-peat, that would mm. – and Dusty win another Norm Smith. I love that stuff. I love seeing the champions be champions. So part of me is a bit upset that they're not there or thereabouts. But um, at the same time, you know, I suppose a freshen up wouldn't go to astray. 
Well, the fourth flag is that hard one. The, um, well, that- look, being a Carl supporter, I think the, f- <laughs> the first one's pretty hard, mate, uh, let alone the second, the third, and the fourth. But, yeah, I do get what you mean. Very, very few. Yeah, the, those, dynasties, those dynasty teams that we've seen at the start of this century, um, yeah, they seem to be able to sort of claw their way to the third, which, you know, is just crazy how we've seen so many great footy teams um, in the last 20-odd years. But that fourth one is is the kicker. So their backs are against the wall. This is this would be the miracle. This would, like, I thought last year was pretty tough, the way they sort of overcame adversity and got it done. Uh, I think this one would trump that, given the position they're in. But, you know, I, I'm happy that as a show we've ruled them out and the dynasty's over, but I, I'm still a little bit apprehensive to do so imagine- because if, any, if anyone was going to do it, it would be the Tigers. Imagine if they did. Imagine if yes, yeah. Imagine if they just in September they sneak into eighth, maybe seventh, and they just put together four games of Richmond footy and go bang, 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 bang. Um, yeah, would be one of the all time all time premierships and probably put well, definitely put them as the greatest side I, I've seen and quite possibly the greatest side of all time. So we'll see. But for the record, it's on the record. Um, it is on the record. It's on the record. Dynasty done. I've written them off. It was a great time. They've had a great few years, but uh, Richmond, yep. you are finished. Their time's done, but a team whose time is just beginning is the Western Bulldogs. What a win they had, McDonald. Yeah, it's so funny the little cycle of um, like I, I think anyone's power rankings would be all over the shop right now. Yeah. Um, it's just it's funny that it's sort of like the Vogue team pops up every now and again. I think the Bulldogs probably were the Vogue team. Um, you know, maybe round nine, round ten, and then I think the D's even, you know, knocked off the dogs and the Lions, and I don't even think they were the Vogue team, but maybe they were. But then the Lions, some of their results, they've sort of pushed pushed their claim. Then the Cats, it's just this juggling act. But the Western Bulldogs, probably their strongest performance for the year so far. They're a funny old side where when they do get it on their terms, they can really torch some footy clubs. I think they've, I think they torched um, Gold Coast. Uh, Saints, Kangaroos, but to do it to a West Coast, which it, it's a great win on paper, you know, top eight team West Coast over there, it is a great win on on paper, and the dogs are flying, but I think, you know, we, we've bashed the Eagles a little bit on this podcast, <laughs> and I, I think that sort of performance, again, with all their stars back, was really disappointing as much as it was impressive for the Bulldogs. Yeah, it's always a tough one in footy where whenever there's a sort of win like this, you know, you're expecting a big game and someone does it pretty easy, does it on the bit. It's um, always a tough one where you try and balance it between congratulating the winner on their tremendous effort and their very impressive performance. And at the same time, Mm. um, you know, you don't want to take away their credit by bashing the opposition too much. In saying that, we'll go ahead and bash the opposition a bit (laughs) (laughs) bit much. Uh, Yeah, well... West Coast. Um, once again, we won't get, we won't dig the hill, dig the boots in too far. But um, <laughs> you have your major contenders. Um, you have the the D's. You have the dogs. You have the cats. Uh, and then you have that the lions. And you have the lions, correct? Yep. Um, and then you have a group just below them, which is probably uh, the power and swans. Well, I would put power, and then mm. I'd put the tigers just because they're the Richmond Tigers. Um, yeah. And then I'd probably have Sydney and I'd have West Coast. I don't know if I mentioned the power in there, but um, they're just above that group. And, yeah, yep. so West Coast are just a couple rings rungs below. Um, who was it that tipped them to win the flag and has stood by them to win the flag as, as, clo- as close as a week ago, he, he said so? It was, it was during the week um, on the midweek rub on Triple M. Um, Joey Montagna asked, you know, who's going to win the flag and asked, asked the boys and some of them didn't answer, but Wayne Carey sort of made a, a bit of a point. He goes, well, I tipped West Coast at the start of the year and I know everyone jumps off their tips and changes their tips, but I'm going to stand by mine, which I thought was really, really interesting. He sort of stated that they're getting players back and they might start to hum with those sort of Optus games towards the end of the season, but that performance just sort of summed their season up a little bit, I felt. Yeah, it did. They're just a bit behind the leading pack. But as for the Dogs, I think the big question mark for them has been um, mainly surrounding their back line and then to a lesser degree their forward line. And obviously there's no questions over their midfield. It's one of the best we've ever seen. But yep. um, as my, And I've agreed with that. I've tended to be on that wavelength where I go, I 
don't have them um, in the same echelon as I do uh, the D's and the Cats and the Lions just because I think that their forwards and their back stocks aren't quite as uh, impressive. But in saying that, at the same time, they say premierships are won and lost in the midfield. And if you've got a system, a defensive system, and you've got a forward structure um, in place with a dominant midfield, maybe it's not that important what your personnel is per se if you've got that calibre of midfield hitting them up, lace out. Yeah, well, I when when a team sort of goes after a Josh Bruce type, I, I sort of I question it because it's not... It's not an A grade. It's not a Tommy Lynch. It's not someone who like you sort of know what you're getting with the Josh Bruce. I, I think he sort of could be a little bit inconsistent. Could go missing in games and and sort of in seasons, but can kick your your bags every now and again. He's someone, yeah, who's just a little bit inconsistent, but ready made sort of big forward. So they they go after someone like him and sort of developing a Shacky, and, and, and then down back, I think on paper they lack a little bit, but at the moment both ends of the ground are humming. Yeah. Um, yeah, like uh, yeah, Joshy Bruce and Aaron Norton, the big astronaut, he's flying. He kicked four, um, and and then yeah, their back line. I, I think I saw a stat, might have been on the couch that I was just watching before this. I'll give the boys credit because they did all the work. But it, it said something like um, the one on ones inside fifty, the Bulldogs are ranked number one. So they're starting to really cement that sort of back six as well. So it's all starting to click for the Bulldogs, and it's at that sort of good time of the year as well. Is Norton the best young key forward in the comp, do you think? Well, he's 21. So I thought he was like 23, 24, sort of coming into his his prime age. To hear that he's 21, I feel like he's been around for ages. I, I was a little bit shocked by that. So mm. I would have um, thought he was about Harry Mackay's age, and I think Mackay's about a 23 or a 24 now. So Yeah, I would have thought that as well. But no, he's got a couple of years on them. He 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 is. He, his marking since day one has been really impressive. Um, and it's continued to be as impressive. And um, his kicking can be a little bit iffy. I suppose every sort of forward slash young forward has those issues. But um, no, he's really starting to get that confidence, that sort of um, that big, that bigger body, that big sort of, you know, playing a bit like a man now. And um, geez, the way he flies at it, it's ominous for back sixes. Gee, if they get him and, you know, they say Ugal Hagen could be anything. If they get them two on the park together for the next decade uh, with the midfield they've got, look out. That could be a dog's dynasty waiting to happen. Um, but mm. one team that'll be right there in their way this year is the D's. And uh, just quickly, McDonald, I got a yes. bit of feedback uh, during the week on the Back Pocket Plugger podcast. Uh, yep. Great uh, friend of the show, avid listener. And Coles. No, not Coles. Andrew Hoppy Hopgood. Um, th- Hoppy. 300 gamer down at the Bear Cave. Um, absolute superstar. Uh, he loves the show, but thinks that it's we put a bit too much emphasis on the D's and the baggers. Um, and Absolutely. Wouldn't mind if we shined a spotlight on uh, a different club occasionally from time to time. So that's why I didn't lead with the D's. I wanted to lead with a, a couple of other clubs, and that's why we're yet to talk about the baggers. But I think we do. We'll get to them, though. We will get, we will get to them. <laughs> but I think uh, all, all I'm saying is Rome wasn't built in a day. We can't completely drop the D's, uh, the D's and the Blues, um, but I hope we can acknowledge that instead of having D's lead the lead the podcast, <laughs> I've moved them down to third rung, and over the coming <laughs> over the coming weeks, you might see them slide to the but you know the the lifestyles part of the newspaper, you know, real yeah. real hide and seek type stuff. Well, I think that might happen if we um, drop off the the sort of headlines, but I I, I would sort of I, I feel like. We're quite conscious of that. Uh, we're obviously going to have that bias, and we do love sort of talking about our own teams, uh, that that's only human nature. But I think we did sort of uh, acknowledge at parts of the year, the Ds were sort of kicking off your, your footy classifieds and whatnot, and then at parts of the year, your Blues and stuff were for sort of opposite reasons. So I feel like we got our finger on the pulse regardless. Yeah, yeah. But we will keep that top of mind, uh, but we will talk about the Demons Demons, yeah. <laughs> for the next half hour. Yeah, so if you want to tune out, we're going to really indulge. Good win over the Bombers. Uh, you went to the game. What was your uh, initial feelings and emotions about the game? Um, I think the Bombers are underrated. And uh, I, I feel like that sort of result was looked upon as like, oh, the Ds were off again. Yeah, maybe forward or centre, I felt like the Ds potentially were. But um, 
that back six is winning the D's games and could win us some big finals coming towards the end of the year. They are as solid as a rock, especially when I think the Bombers are the best offensive side, uh, maybe the second best to potentially Geelong over the last little bit, but they are one of the best offensive sides, um, the Bombers, and they were bringing it in thick and fast towards the last quarter. I had a, um, a bit of a funny old day at the footy, Rog. It was... I didn't get me normal tickets where I like to normally sit. I was sort of in the outer, mm. in amongst the bombers faithful, uh, and um, you've uh, you're in with the uh, you're back with the pack, <laughs> mate. You, no more ro- <laughs> no more footy ro- royalty, Mister sixty k subs. I'll sit bloody with Gillan McLaughlin, <laughs> Gillan McLaughlin in the corporate box. You're ba- you're back in the cheap seats with the common folk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh yes Well I couldn't get The guest passes For the MCC Unfortunately mm. So me and Mitter Used uh, Used his Bombers memberships In amongst the faithful I had an absolute ball But boy Boy oh boy They were They were Just Clinging on To any sort of Umpiring decision From the bounce The Bombers faithful um, Some of the stuff That I was hearing In the crowd Was I thought A little bit Not safe for work And um, I felt like some of their frustrations during key parts of the game felt sort of misplaced. I felt like, um, yeah, it was just an interesting in, in, interesting sort of night where, you know, Mitter Bowl, absolute bombers nuffy, loves the bombers to death. He was sort of uh, rolling his eyes at some of the, uh, the things getting yelled out and he was almost a little bit sheepish sitting next to me. Um, and it, it sort of... Uh, came to a head in that last quarter. The frustration and the passion from the Bombers faithful all game, appealing, appealing for sort of deliberate out of bounces that didn't go out and they were appealing for holding the balls that um, were handballed and they were just going off their rocker. I could hear, you know, uh, seats getting smacked and beers going everywhere and it sort of all came to a head and it felt like they sort of spoke it into existence. They sort of spoke these poor decisions into existence and it all came to a head late in the last quarter. Um, Christian Petrarca got dragged off the footy. He tried that swinging leg, that sort of um, break, you know, get out of jail free card sort of foot that you throw at it when you've been caught. Um, he didn't get boot to ball and they didn't call holding the ball. I thought that was the wrong decision. I thought Christian Petrarca, it was early in that last quarter. I thought he was caught red handed um, and it would have been a shot on goal to the Bombers. And then there was another late one with three minutes to go that I personally don't think was there, but the Bombers faithful did. So James Harms in the heat of the battle picks it up, slippery ball, takes a step, maybe half a step to be honest, gets dragged off the footy from Tipper as he tries to sling a boot to it, misses the ball, and um, the umpire called play on because of the no prior. He didn't dispose of it correctly, Rog, and that's where that grey area comes in. So, you know... James Harms definitely didn't dispose of the ball in a correct manner, but I think if you play the tape in normal speed, you see that the great man just didn't have time. Picked it up, tried to throw it on the boot, sort of got dragged off the ball. Uh, But yeah, no, that was the one that the Bombers faithful really, really were irate about. And I just felt like, you know, standing over the fence at the MCG, getting dragged away from security, Screaming at the arms, you know, slapping chairs, yelling expletives, um, riding 19-year-old James Jordan after he got clobbered in the head in the goal square. I, I thought it was maybe a little bit too far. You know, I, I love the passion, but maybe a little bit too much passion. Um, and, yeah, it was just a, a bit of an interesting night at the footy. Well, I think it's no secret whatsoever that um – Oh, well, let me rephrase. I was about to go a bit hard. I'll, I'll ease my stance. Every supporter, every supporter base um, of every club have good supporters and every supporter base has bad supporters. Um, yep. The long-term best friend of mine, Michael Allen, Essendon supporter, fantastic supporter. Um, we, you know, Carlton, Essendon, bitter rivals. Carlton is his most hated club. <laughs> Essendon is my most hated club. Yet we still find a way to have a great time at the footy and send each other great banter, great spirits. However, yeah. when it comes to the worst of a football club, if we took the bottom 20% of supporters of each club, there is no doubt in most people's minds, I think, that Essendon's have the worst of the lot. Essendon's ferals are the most feral of any. Um, mm. And people will say... Uh, you're just saying that because you're a Carlton supporter, but I think the proof is in the pudding. I've got an article here to support me. I would say that there is no 
greatest sin in football, um, uh, in supporting sport worldwide, than booing your own players. These are players that uh, have gone out there, they're rearing your jumper, they're trying their hardest every week. Um, They're out there because they're one of the best footballers in the country. Uh, You're in your seat because um, you've eaten too many hot chips in your time and you're not athletic. (laughs) So they're out there trying their hardest. So for you to boo your own player who's trying to win a game for your side, risking limb from limb every single week, um, I think that's absolutely outrageous. Here's 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 the headline. Uh, this is going back from 2011, but there have been many incidents with the Essendon supporter base. Uh, Matthew mm. Lloyd says Essendon fans hit new low during concussed jeering concussed Brent Stanton, and then just a little uh, snippet of the article. Essendon legend Matthew Lloyd says Bombers fans stooped to a new low when they cheered after Brent Stanton was concussed yesterday. Lloyd said Essendon yeah. supporters were right up there with the worst in the league at attacking their own players. He said he was disgusted when the decision to substitute Stanton out of the game against West Coast after he suffered concussion was met with loud cheers with the Bombers fans. Now, th- this is the vibe I get from the worst of the Bombers faithful. Um, they just stoop to new lows constantly. And uh, mm. just be aware, Bombers fans... Everyone thinks the same thing. Um, your feral, <laughs> your ferals are the worst of the lot. We all have our ferals, but we think well, you, uh, you guys have a few more. That's my belief anyway. Yeah, well, I think yeah, there's been a couple of incidents and I put like the good uh, Bombers fans in the passionate, like, as passionate as anyone else. And I, I, I love some of the, you know, some of my mates are, are really good Bombers fans, but I just get that. I've just seen it time and time again where – consistently they can sort of go over the line. I remember a couple of times last year DMing your Dill Grimes and your Cal Wards, um, some real vulgar stuff during during that, that you know, those sort of sagas. And then, yeah, I, I think I sugarcoated my Saturday night a little bit um, and you obviously know how my night went and you sort of read between the lines. But they, they – I'm putting it down to passion. <laughs> they, they were very passionate, but I felt like it was sort of a little bit misplaced and a little bit um, – Inappropriate, to be honest. Yeah, well, I, um, uh, you said that Mitter um, said this at the football, and it's something that I felt as well. You can get a bit annoying going to the football sometimes, and this might this sounds like I'm on a high horse, and I probably am, but it <laughs> it can get a bit frustrating when you're at the footy and you're surrounded by proper nuffies that full blown have no idea what they're talking about, and I'm talking Carlton supporters as well. When you when you're surrounded by people that just and they're yelling shit, and you're there going, do you even have it? You you're you're appealing for a free kick that isn't even around anymore. You know, there'll be some, yeah, there'll be supporters yes. who say going, he took it out of the rock to be a free kick. And I'm there going, mate, that rule was changed fucking a year or two ago. You can, you're allowed yep. to take it out of the rock now. Um, yeah. But without fail, every single time I go to a Carlton Essendon game, I have that sensation with the Essendon faithful. I don't know what it is. Um, I don't know why it is. Um, but you ask a lot of people and they sen- tend to say the same thing. So hopefully, um, hopefully they find a way to turn it around. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Like essentially, Mitter, who who loves his bombers, sort of goes. This is why I sometimes prefer to watch the game at home. <laughs> with some of his comments, but you know, it could have just been the little section that we were sitting at. And um, I, I'm not trying to say bombers fans stop being passionate. I just think, uh, yeah, there's got to be a little bit of self awareness. Like you're at the footy, there's families there. Um, it is what it is. But really, I think hats off to the bombers. At the end of the day, they were really, really brave. I think their brand of footy was super exciting. You know, seeing Jake Stringer ping through the middle of the G, having shots from 60. I was going, geez, how are we going to stop this bloke? And, um, yeah, I I think respect to the Ds for getting over the line. And I don't think that that's that's a poor result by the Ds sort of result. I think that's a, you know, gritty sort of win against a team that'll trouble a lot of people. Absolutely, and uh, you're still the team to beat. I think that um, the way you professionally get it done against these sort of outfits will hold you in extremely good stead come September. If it wasn't the Dogs this week, Roggy, I think um, the best result was probably the Lions on the Thursday night. First thing, you know, it seems to change every week, but the Cats were probably number one on the power rankings after their win against the Dogs and um, the way they've been travelling. And the Lions, to do a real number on them on Thursday night, was probably up there with the results of the round. Yeah, well, we talked about earlier that Richmond aren't really building towards anything. And the Lions are the complete opposite. They started the season a little bit shaky. There were question marks. Mm. I remember everyone thinking, oh, okay, well, they're still a good side, but they probably won't be in that top two or three. Um, but they've kept yeah. building and building and building, and here they are now. And it's very hard to 
disregard them as a premiership fantasy because of how good a football they're playing. And um, it, I don't want to fall into the trap of catastrophizing every single time uh, Geelong lose a game and lose it convincingly because at the start of the season, I sort of wrote them off and they didn't look too crash hot and I was there going, oh, they're too old. And that's that's the easy way out. I think that's a cheap headline. Um, yep. <laughs> uh, but here I am again. The the day de- uh, the Lions absolutely ran them off their feet, and the Cats didn't really have a response. And it does leave you thinking all of a sudden: um, Are they too old? And but on the flip side, whenever the Geelong, you know, they always seem to just get that win in a tight game. They always find a way to get that kick after the siren or whatever. And everyone yep. always says their experience, their experience holds them up at the crucial points. And you wait until September, that sort of experience will um, take them to a flag. So every week it seems to change the the conversation and the discourse around Geelong. Um, it's either they're too old or they're full of experience. And this week it happens to be their yeah. this week it happens to be they're too old. But um, once again, we don't want to talk about the losing side too much, as much as I know you would love to stick the stick the cleats into <laughs> Geelong. But um, yeah, the Lions were absolutely fantastic. They're a team that don't really have any holes anywhere. And mm. um, they're just a, a great side to watch. They are so watchable. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, absolutely so watchable. I think their foot skills are um, some of the best in the comp. They sort of, you know, w- when the dogs are on Marvel and absolutely humming, that's sort of how Brisbane play anywhere. Um, I've seen Brisbane sort of, yeah, just get on top of teams through their foot skills. And some of their kicking, and it happened on the weekend, it, it's a kick where... If it's an inch over the head, or if it's an inch to the left, um, a Jack Henry or a Tom Stewart gets a gets a fist in, but it's sort of just perfectly drilled in, and it's it's coming from your Jared Lyons and your Daniel Riches, and these are some of the best skilled blokes in the comp. Um, it is just yeah, it, it is what's separating the Lions from a lot of teams, um, especially in the top four. But they've also got a good spread of talent coming through. I think. You know, Reese Matheson's, he's sort of, you know, three or four or five pre-seasons in. He, he bobs up every now and again as sort of that 23rd player. Um, but someone who probably kicked Reese Matheson out of the side, um, for, well, Dane Zorko came in, but it was sort of out of uh, between these two blokes. It was sort of between um, Reese Matheson and Devin Robertson. Oh. And I spoke about Dev Robertson a couple of weeks ago. I flagged him. I said he's been super, super impressive. Um was meant to go on night one of the draft, slip through the to night uh, night two. I remember all the drama watching that a couple of seasons ago. He's playing in one of the best midfielders in one of the best midfields. He's playing so so well and so consistently, and he got the rising star nom as well. So it's just it's looking good for the Lions, and I think the thing that separates them from the D's necessarily, um, maybe not so much the Cats and the Power, but I think what what separates the Lions from yeah, the D's in particular is that they've had a couple of finals uh, series in a row. So I feel like they're sort of, um, they're ready for it. They're sort of, uh, yeah, prepared for what's to come. So, geez, they are looking exciting. They are. And I really do hope they have a grand final, uh, they make a grand final because they have quite possibly, this was actually a friend of the show, Michael, who uh, said this, and I tend to agree. They could have the most amount of potential Norm Smith winners on their side. And I know that sounds a bit silly. You could argue that each side has 22 players that could win a Norm Smith. Um, <laughs> yeah. But you look at North uh, North Melbourne. <laughs> you definitely don't look at North Melbourne's. Uh, you, you look <laughs> at Brisbane's list and there are so many players that I think, gee, they are capable of that three-vote game that gets them the Norm Smith. And one that I would absolutely love to see, I would love to see Mitch Robinson go bananas on grand final day. He would be an absolute madman. And there are some times when watching... He would. Him, there are times where watching him do the kamikaze stuff can get a little bit frustrating. Mm. It's like he's going going over the top, trying too hard to play this character of, oh, I'm tough and I'll throw myself at every contest. But I think come grand final time, that'll be that exciting to watch. And no man embodies the win at all cost spirit, which is what grand finals are all about. That in Michi Robinson, so I'd love to see I'd love to see the Lions in the grand final. And as you did say, uh, Devin Robertson um, got the Rising Star nom this week. Who do you um, who do you think might be leading the race for that Rising Star? Um, 
I am wearing my Melbourne cap on another episode, and I don't want to be the biased bloke. Um, but I deep down, I think Luke Jackson's probably leading it. I think Tom Green is up there, um, and I think Nick Cox is probably going to be the best player out of the crop. But I don't think he's been as consistent. Um, I think he's probably yeah that that player that excites you the most. Um, and but he hasn't really torn a game to shreds or been as consistent as maybe like a Tom Green or a Lukey Jackson so far this season. So for mine, it's probably Luke Jackson at the moment. What about yourself? Well, you're probably right. I think I'm leaning towards Luke Jackson, but the forgotten man. And this is a bloke who, if you ask a lot of supporters um, uh, who this bloke is, they'd say, I don't know who he is and I don't know who he <laughs> plays for. But... Uh, and we hate to talk about the D's again, but James Jordan, this is a bloke who's just come mm. in and playing midfield for the best side in the competition each week and just doing his role. And um, I'm not so much saying with confidence that he's my clubhouse leader, but I just can't believe the lack of conversation around him. I think, uh, you know, a- any club would love to have a bloke of his talent in, the, in their side. Yeah, he... Yeah, he, he. Yeah, we won't harp on about the D's, but he, he is a forgotten man. And I was listening to Triple M and they were sort of joking, like, can you name number 23 for the D's? And they said, oh, it's Jordan. And then they said, oh, well, can you name his first name? And they, like, these are some of the best. Um, at, 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 oh, far out. At, Analysts. Analysts. <laughs> That's what I was going for, but I just couldn't get that out. Yeah. Wow. You went, uh, I reckon you had about six spots of the, six spots of the cherry then. And, analyst. Uh, yeah. Oh, man. I had the, um, the Josh Kennedy sort you of did. stutter step go, going for you it. You did, but yeah, as long so, as we so, slot it through the middle in the end, that's all that matters. Maybe I gave the handball out the back to her and he <laughs> just potted it through. But, yeah, some of the best analysts in the game, um, yeah, really weren't uh, aware of the bloke. And this was round six or seven. So, um, yeah, 23 touches on the weekend, two goals. Um, in a pretty stacked midfield, he comes in and plays a bit of a defensive role in the mid. But, yeah, so th- th- there's just an exciting crop this year. And I think it sort of sums up the year. Like, usually we know the Brownlow medalists from round five. We know the Rising Star. We know from round five. We know the Premier from round five. But it's just an absolute um, dog race at the moment for everything. So it's quite exciting. It is very exciting. I can't wait to see what happens next. But probably uh, the, the part of the year that I am most excited for, the potential iconic moment in history, is the great man Lance Buddy Franklin perhaps storming his way to 1,000 goals. And the experts seem to think that it's the last time we'll ever see it unless the game undergoes a drastic uh, makeover. Um, mm. And the math is... He has 27 goals to kick. He has 27 left. And there are eight games remaining. So he needs 3.3 goals a game. Do you think he'll get there? I don't. Not this year. Do you think he'll play another year? Does he have another year left on the contract? He's got one more year left on the oh, contract. Oh, I didn't know that. I thought this was his last year for some, like on the contract for some reason. No. So he's got another year up his sleeve. I don't know if he plays on. I'm not really sure um, what the go is there. But I don't think he gets there I this year. I reckon he does. Oh, it wouldn't surprise me. That, you know why I reckon he does? Because if it was any other year and there wasn't a thousand goals on the line, and you just said in the last eight games will Buddy average three point three, I'd say probably not, maybe, but probably not. But yeah. he need he he wants to get to a thousand this year, right? So imagine you know the energy that it built around Sydney <laughs> going into finals. They could and they'll be playing finals, so it could potentially. Well, yeah, they might have more games up the sleeve. Ima- imagine if it's in finals, week one or week two, halfway through the last quarter, <laughs> he's banged it through. And if there's a if we're allowed crowds at the game, they storm onto the ground and bloody that could bloody catapult Sydney into a premiership. But um, it could, yeah. Uh, but the reason why I think so is because. Uh, say even if they don't make finals or whatever, I think in the next seven games you'll see him kick his odd bag. He might he needs to average three point three. He might average two goals. Yep. But then he gets to the last round and it's all about Buddy. The last round it's will Buddy kick six goals to get to the thousand? <laughs> and when it's lights, camera, action, and it's a full blown Lance Buddy Franklin show in the last round, I wonder who they're playing. Whatever it is, he might only need to kick two goals. He might need to kick eight. But I can guarantee you in that last game when Sydney play, and I've got to – oh, you won't believe who they're playing in the last round. Is it Carlton? They're playing the Gold Coast. When, oh. 
at, when <laughs> Sydney play the Gold Coast at the SCG and Buddy Franklin has seven goals to kick, you can be rest assured he's kicking 15. Well, I'm pretty sure Ben Brown kicked a, a couple of goals, was leading the Coleman, and then a team played, I think GWS played the Gold Coast, and Jeremy Cameron just got handed the, the Coleman because he kicked about 10, and it was sort of junk time, and it was sort of just to get him the Coleman style. Um so I reckon that's happened a couple of years in a row where someone's kicked a bag late to steal it. And, yeah, if there was anybody to do it, it wouldn't surprise me that the big Budwa could do it. But, geez, that game on the weekend, he kept the Swans in it. I think he kicked their last two goals of the game to give them a lead before the power rocketed back. Um, Scotty Lysette kicking the sealer. Uh, just unbelievable scenes. They're saying it was one of the matches of the year. Yeah, I'm spewing. Um, I unfortunately uh, missed that game. I was out and about. I had a bit of uh, Mexican, actually, a bit of bottomless Mexican. I was smashing fish bowls and, and uh, tequila shots. But everyone seems to say it was one of the matches of the year. And I was watching the Sunday footy show the next day. What a program. And yeah. they couldn't have been any more complimentary of the match. Apparently, it was just um, a, a prime example of how football should be played. Well, did you hear about um, Sam Mays? I did not hear about Sam Mays. So Sam Mays was playing in the Sandful. I don't understand how this happens, but Sam Mays playing in the Sandful, obviously in Adelaide, in Adelaide, um, gets a call at halftime. Hey, mate, we actually might need you as the sub. So he stops playing halfway through a Sandful game. Gets in the car, goes to Adelaide Oval. About, I think it might have been third quarter or whatnot. There's an injury. Sam Mays comes on, and he ends up kicking one of the winners. One of the one of the winners to put him in front. He might have kicked the goal that put him in front, and then Scotty Lysette kicked the sealer. So, what a bizarre day. You just you're playing Sandful. You've accepted. You know, I'm playing a game of footy for the weekend. All good. Half time. You're on on the way to an AFL game. Just that bizarre, but is bizarre. Unbelievable. Do you give Port Adelaide? Any hope whatsoever? No. Neither do I. I don't. <laughs> neither do I. I'd love to. I like Port Adelaide. I like what they're about. I like them too. I like I'm a big bokey man. I'm a, I'm I a love Hinkley Charlie man. Charlie Dixon. I'm a Hinkley man. Yes. Um, yep. And I'd like Alea, to. Alia Kane Farrell. <laughs> <laughs> Kane Mitchell. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I like them all. But uh, love their young crop. But I'm struggling to. Um, I'm struggling to see them just be up there with that top tier. Yeah, and it's probably probably their results early in the year, which is what's sort of troubling me. I suppose Geelong went over and um, did them dirty a couple of weeks ago. So still, they're just not that top three or four team, even though I think they're above Geelong on the ladder currently. But yeah, they, I just don't have the trust in them. I suppose if they do get a couple of finals at Adelaide Oval, it's on for young and old. But if they don't, if they're travelling to a Gabba or an MCG, I just can't see it happening. Now, something else I cannot quite see happening is us talking about the baggies in this podcast, and no. uh, it, primarily because we're starting to run out of time and we need to get to the GBOs, but also because they've been so disappointing this season, and I don't want to be a Debbie Downer, I don't want to be a Mark McClure, uh, yep. but I'd like to see them just do give me a couple of weeks in a row, maybe a, a nice <coughs> month patch before I go wrapping them up and uh, talking about how promising <laughs> the future is. So you did well, Carlton, but I'd like to see a bit more before we dedicate a whole segment to you. And that will lead us into our GBOs. Do you want to kick us off with your out on the full McDonald? I do. I do. Um, I was watching the game on Thursday night. Obviously, top of the table clash, the Cats and the Lions. Now, it was a heated affair, and the Lions came out as that sort of little brother trying to take on the big brother. Um, Geelong have bullied this Lions side for a decade, so it was sort of line-in-the-sand type game. But I felt like the way the Cats responded or the way the Cats handled that sort of physical pressure a little bit um, undisciplined, and it was a little bit disappointing. Obviously, they're a champion side, the Cats, but um, Cameron did a big dump tackle on Lockie Neal, which I thought was a little bit dirty, but one of those dirty ones, it was dirty boxing, one of those dirty ones, but sort of in the rules. Yeah. Uh, and then I saw Tom Stewart crack it at Charlie Cameron, and he was giving him the, the double behind the back, jumper punch to the back of his head, sort of ramming it into the turf a little bit um, 
Zachy Williams style, not to that extent, but it was a similar action. And I thought, geez, that's a bit, that's a bit ugly. And then there was another incident with Tom Hawkins on the boundary line where I think it was Payne, the player, who ran into him as the ball went um, out of bounds. Tommy Hawkins just grabs him by the collar and gives him the double jumper punch and just sort of walks over him. So there was just a couple of incidents, probably a frustrated evening uh, for the Cats, but I thought just a couple of incidents sort of lowered their colours a little bit for mine. And I think they're better than that, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, they have been accused of that sort of stuff. We've seen Joel Selwood in the past couple of weeks and really over the last um, portion of his career, people are raising eyebrows and asking questions of uh, when he tends to step over the line a little bit or toe the line. So, yeah, well, I, I don't think they'll change, to be honest. I don't think you'll see them in the next few weeks um, ease off. I think, if anything, Chris Scott would be there telling them, this is our brand, boys. We stick up for one another and and, yeah. and we hit them hard. So we'll see how that uh, goes for them in September. Um, I don't think they care about the respect of the public as long as they keep getting those results. Um, yeah, for sure. My out on the full. Um, now, I'm not an umpire basher, so I'm not going to – I don't think it's their fault. It's the hardest game of all in the world to um, – umpire and uh, there's so much gray area how could they get every decision right uh, but one issue I do have is that umpires are still part-time um, part, yeah. part-time employees and I think that we would see a lot better officiating um, and a lot more consistent officiating if they were full-time I think even in the A-League the referees are full-time now. So I see no reason why we can't have full-time umpires. Um, give, them a, give them a decent wage. That would also encourage, I don't know if you've heard, but there's an umpire crisis at local level. Um, there are not enough umpires uh, signing up uh, in the grassroots footy, which is of no surprise. Yep. Why would you want to sign up yeah. to be an umpire when all you see is them getting abused no matter what? Every single game, every single game, the comments <laughs> revolve around the umpires being shit. And newsflash to your footy public, the umpires aren't shit every game. There's just a bunch of one-eyed supporters out there. Um, mm. So there's a grassroots footy at a, a, a grassroots issue with the umpiring. And I think if we offered a full-time, jo- good, good-paying job, a sort of a luxurious yeah. career at the end of it, you would say that issue be potentially resolved and you would see the umpiring improve tremendously. Yeah, I think it probably doesn't help when um, people bring out umpire songs and diss tracks. <laughs> um, I think that's <laughs> sort, of going, in yeah, the wrong, nah, sort uh, of going in the wrong direction. <laughs> umpire McBurney is a dog, apparently, if you li- if you listen to the lyrics closely. But uh, that's, not, that's not here nor there as we go into seamlessly the behinds. Oh, it's a parody. It was all tongue-in-cheek. Yeah. Uh, um, Genuinely was. Uh, yeah, my behind is the GWS Giants. Jeez, I reckon they could have been a, um, in our goals a couple of weeks ago potentially because they started the year off pretty poorly and then uh, they sort of found a little bit of form with that young side that they were rolling out. They've dropped off. They should have beaten North Melbourne, like not on the day but just on paper. On the day they should have got rolled and they were lucky to get the draw. But, you know, on paper should have beaten North Melbourne and on paper – should have pumped the Hawks. So they should be a game in the eight. I think they've bundled their season in this little couple-week window. Yeah. They, and it's they, – they, yeah, they're just in that maybe pile for mine because it's like they should be better than where they are, but they're not. And I was sort of impressed with that middle patch of the year where they started to hum a little bit, but now I'm sort of that glass half empty on them again. Yeah, I think when – um and I don't know the, the mindset of the players. Obviously, I'm not there. But I can only imagine that if you reach the pinnacle or close to the pinnacle of the sport, you know, you make a grand final and you, uh, unfortunately, they got belted by the Tigers. But, you know, they, they still made a grand final. And then to see yourself regress back down the ladder, I imagine that would be incredibly deflating. And I would be very impressed if the same coach that took them to the grand final and then saw them bow out of the eight um, would is capable of lifting them back up. Um, so I'm not saying that I think Leon Cameron should get the flick, but I'm just saying that I'd be very surprised if the same coach could uh, take that same group to the pinnacle once again. Well, to sort of um, read between the lines, that Amazon doco, and I know that this showed absolutely nothing of the relationships and what happened behind closed doors, but that Amazon doco didn't really paint... um, their footy department as a footy department that had it all together. Like Leon Cameron sort of dragging 
Keneally in and dropping him. It was all sort of awkward. It was all a bit clunky. There was things in there that it, it definitely didn't sort of come across the way the Tigers came across in that doco. So maybe, you know, I'm not saying Leon Cameron's a bad coach. I think he's a very good coach. Obviously coached him to a grand final, but eight, seven, seven, eight years, sort of hearing the same voice, sort of like uh, the position the Pies are in. I feel like a little refresh might not hurt, but um, I guess time will tell. Absolutely. My behind is the North Melbourne Football Club. And the reason why they're behind is because they should be a goal, really. They've just, you know, beaten the Gold Coast. Um, But everyone said at the start of the year and throughout the season, oh, they're not going to win a game. North Melbourne, they're one of the worst sides of all time. Um, I can't say where they'll possibly get a win from. Um, And... I'm wrapped for them that they've managed to get two wins in a draw to this point, and they'll probably get another result or two before the season's done. So I'm stoked for them. The only reason why they're behind and not a goal this week is because they are still last on the ladder. So it's hard to <laughs> it's hard to give them the six points. But I yeah. just think they deserve to get a pat on the back for you know nothing's that funny with the thing about football. Nothing's ever as bad as you think it is, or as what people say it is. You can turn things around quickly, and I think we are yep. starting to see the foundations of a future there for them. And, um, yeah, they've uh, pleasantly surprised a lot, I think, with the way they've gone about their footy lately. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it just breeds that little bit of light at the end of the tunnel for the North fans, even though I think they're probably a couple of years off contending for finals, and they know that. But it's just um, those little signs of encouragement along the way is what keeps you coming to the footy. Uh, My goal this week goes to... Brett Bewley. Do you know who that is? Yeah, the Dockers man. <laughs> I don't I don't know why you're giving him a goal, but uh, I like his name and uh, I like what, he gets, what he's about. I would absolutely not have known his name before the weekend. So Nat Fife trained with the team, travelled with the team, um, did a sort of fitness test before the game and said, oh, my shoulder isn't quite right. So Brett Bewley got named as his replacement. And I think pre-game, Maybe not, but I think pre-game, Dockers fans open up the footy record or go onto your Twitter or whatnot and sort of go, oh, geez, five, he's a laid out. Oh, geez, Brett Bewley's in. And you sort of go, oh, God, how is this going to turn out? <laughs> the bloke rocks up, kicks two of their last three. Uh, the Dockers get over the line. He was uh, he might have kicked the sealer, um, if not the winner. Um, and it's just a funny old day at the office for Brett Bewley. One second he's sort of getting ready to, you know, be a travelling emergency, and the next second he's kicking sealers for fun in the middle of Marvel. That is sensational. I, I if you had have given me twenty thousand guesses, I don't know if I could have guessed that your goal would be Brett Bewley, especially considering <laughs> I missed the Fremantle game. Um, but I'm glad that it is, and this could be the first ever week that. Um, we have two interstate players as our goals because my goal is Daniel Rich. Um, uh, yes, <laughs> this, great goal. This is a man who a few years ago, he was almost a little bit written off by the competition. He was half a whipping mm. boy. Um, when Brisbane weren't going too flash or they were being a bit disappointing, um, people would flag Daniel Rich you know, off a halfback flag, you know, high draft pick. He was only getting his 16 disposals, not having much influence. Um but here he is absolutely dominating games and he's kicking. It's a it's a miracle or not miracle isn't the right word, but it's amazing that more players can't kick the way he can. Like what Yeah. It's amazing that he's managed to separate himself from the bunch so clearly and obviously because he just he bites off the kick through the guts from the back line, which is, you know, just about the most dangerous kick in footy. He kicks it over a couple of de- couple of would be defenders and uh Always laser beam hits his target. So I'm a massive Daniel Rich fan. I love the way he plays. He's tough. He hits targets. And I'd love to have him in my lineup, McDonald. Yeah, he's amazing. He always gets like that sort of top spin flight, even though he's not spinning the ball that way. But it's sort of like just goes over a couple of hands, hits the targets, and it just opens up the lines. And as you were saying, they're one of the most watchable teams in the comp. He's one of the main reasons they are because of the way he opens up the field with his kicking. Uh, Rog, I think that could be us for another episode of the Back Pocket Plugger podcast. Um, do you have anything to plug? H- h- how do you find the app? H- how are you travelling? Oh, all I've got to say is that's how you bloody do it, Drusy. That's how you do it, son. <laughs> well, welcome to the big leagues, Shagger. <laughs> you warm the seat for me nicely, but the, the kings are back in their rightful throne. 
<laughs> surprise, surprise, the king is back. Um, geez, that'll send sort of headlines and, and, and sort of, uh, you know. Send a ripple through hey, the footy community. Yeah, a ripple o- over to WA. That's going to be massively talked about, that sort of statement. Big statement here on the Back Pocket Plugger podcast, if you don't mind. Uh, well, that's it from us. Uh, we appreciate everyone who tuned in on the iTunes and the Spotify and whatnot, and we appreciate everyone who watched on the YouTube as well. We'll see you all for some more podcasts very, very soon. See you later, guys. Keep plugging those back pockets.